Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast, an iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award nominee. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so honored and so very, very happy that you are joining us in our mission to help all families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Good Pods, Podcast Attic, Himalaya, Ghana, wherever you find your podcasts. And please be sure to tell all of your family and friends about the show. Spread the word to everybody you know and love. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by Snoodles in Space, a snoodle, the Zoodle Cadoodles, and one happy schmoodle, written by our friend and award-winning author, Stephen Joseph. I love this book. It is amazing. In this book... When the Zoodle Cadoodles from the planet Zoodle abduct Norman Noodle and Sally Strudel, the Zoodle Cadoodles threaten to take all of Earth's noodles unless they perform the necessary brain operation on their grand leader, Cloodle the Grand Rudel, and fix the spaceship's failing engines. One problem, Norman Noodle and Sally Strudel are simply fakers. Sour Crudman's pickly, peppered, purple, propulsion-powered pickle invention is the, their only hope. But will he unite with Herbie Schnudelman to save the planet? The answer is here in this wackadoodle tale from outer space. We love this book. You're going to love it, too. It is Stephen Joseph's latest book, Snoodles in Space, a snoodle, the zoodle Kadoodles, and one happy schmoodle. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by A is for Always, an adoption alphabet written by Linda Cutting. Linda tells us that this book is inspired by her daughter, a Chinese-American girl adopted into an all-white family when she was only six. She stomped down the hall carrying two books, demanding to know why her adoption book was different from her white brother's. Linda says her daughter asked her to write a book for adoptees from everywhere so no one would feel left out. A book that addressed the challenges as well as the joys of adoption. You and your kids are going to love this beautiful book. It's a beautiful message and the illustrations are absolutely beautiful. Every page shows a different adopted family of cuddly animals welcoming and cherishing a new child. A is for always. It hit number one on Amazon for new releases. It should be in your family library. Get your copy today. A is for always an adoption alphabet by Linda Cutting. Join us right now from the beautiful Garden State of New Jersey. Our guest is here today to celebrate her really fun picture book. It's called There's a Yeti in My Tummy. Please welcome to the show Meredith Russo. Hey, Meredith, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm excited. I'm excited, too. I'm imagining having a Yeti in your tummy is probably pretty uncomfortable. Implausible, to be sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> however, a lot of the kids seem to have them. Well, you know, you have to explain that. Absolutely. So, so uh, like uh, the background for how the book came to be and um, how there was a Yeti in, so the book was inspired by my two sons who are now eight and six, Matthew and Luke. Um, but uh, back when they were in preschool and I had the idea for the book, the original Yeti wasn't in my son's tummy. It was actually in his hair. <laughs> I would come down from, I would come down in the morning um, with them for, to get them breakfast ready. And his hair would just be this giant mop of bedhead, like, like Yu-Gi-Oh. And one day, and at the same time, they were always like, you know, being really active. They were preschoolers and it was the lockdown <laughs> and we were getting a full display of all their really big feelings and big emotions 
And so he had this giant mop of bedhead at breakfast and probably right before that he'd been roaring or stomping or doing his usual morning antics. And I said to him like, Oh buddy, it's, it's like there's a Yeti in your hair. And I got the idea for the story. I'm like, huh, that's a really, that's an interesting idea. And I got the idea for the picture book to, to write about these kids having like this, the child in the book appropriately named Matthew having feelings so big that he felt like it was personified by a Yeti just coming, bursting out of him with like all these like wild and bananas antics. Like he was just so excited and happy and silly and mighty. He just had to share it in this really big, larger than life way. Yeah. So for the few folks out there who aren't into cryptids like myself, just remind everybody what a Yeti is. Absolutely. So, um, a Yeti is like an abominable snowman. Um, the one that I always think of is the one from the movie Monsters, Inc., where <laughs> where Mike and um, Sully are like in the uh, in the um, um, Himalayas and they come across the big white abominable snowman, it's, it, which is a Yeti. Um, other names are Sasquatch, mm-hmm. which I think is the North American one. I'm not I've never met one, thankfully, <laughs> except in the form of kids, big feelings. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> I I I I really like this because I think it's um I think it's really important. We talk uh about here in the podcast and we've talked about this in the podcast in the past. Uh kids do have lots of feelings. I think we forget that for, you know, for for most of us, you know, some of the most mundane things, the things that we've done a, a bazillion times in our lives by the time you get to my age, which is almost a hundred, um, you know, it's like, uh, it's the big deal. But for kids, for, for a lot of kids from ages, you know, zero to five, six, seven, they're doing a lot of things for the very first time mm-hmm. in their lives. And they're experiencing feelings for the very first time in their lives. Mm-hmm. And exactly. a, a, a lot of kids, you know, uh, we really celebrate, Adults who are passionate about different things, passionate about different causes and 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 music and sports and things like that. Uh, those feelings, you know, those kids who are so passionate about their feelings when they're four and five, it's not as cute because it's making us crazy and it feels like there's a Yeti exploding <laughs> out of them. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, part of what I found helped as, as a parent, and I'm still like, the boys still have, the boys still have big feelings. They have yetis and it just grows and changes with them as they're growing. Um, when I wrote this book, they were in preschool. So a lot of that was the big, the, the, the silliness and the big feelings that were just so bonkers. You almost couldn't couldn't you couldn't you couldn't you make it up like you know it was it's like real life was stranger than fiction and i think what i found helped me during that time and still helps me now is to try and embrace the the joy in the chaos <laughs> because you know they yes they'll get they'll get so excited when they're trying something new for the first time other times they just can't contain if they want to wheelhouse their way around the soccer field you're excited that they got signed up for soccer and you're you're expecting your little kid who's kicked everything else around the house to kick this ball on the field and then they're the only one off to the side just spinning around like a pinwheel with their arms out because they're happy to be on the field and in nature and i mean this is from personal experience <laughs> You're like, why is my kid doing that? But then you just have to, if you take a step back and you just, you try and love and embrace that joy about them and what they're feeling, it, it makes things, it makes things happier. It's, it's, it's hard. It, there's no, there's no way about it. There's a, it's, it's hard when the little kids have really big feelings that can be inconvenient when they're having a tantrum in the middle of the supermarket and you just need to get out of there before something gets knocked over when they don't want to participate in like the, the, you know, how the kids will have like the, the singing programs Mm -hmm. and your kid's the only one that's like off on the side, just like staring. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Like it's, it's hard in the moment, but what I really wanted to share with this series in particular is the joy 
in those big feelings that the little kids have, because when you can share that reading together with your, your son or your daughter or your grandkid, when you can share that in the story and laugh along with them, and then hopefully use that later on, like you see they're being really silly. It's like, oh, someone's got a Yeti in their tummy. It's a way to connect with them. And I just that sharing that joy is what means the most to me and what I hope people get out of the, the series the most. Well, I'm I'm really excited that you you shared that because as you're talking, um, I'm picturing that. And I know that there's so many different kids, you know, my, my kids are, are adults now, but they grew up and they were very different. My daughter was a kid who kind of fit into everything and could, could read a room and mm-hmm. whatever situation she was in from like two years old, uh, whatever situation she was in, she was able to like immediately, all right, how am I supposed to act and get there? And She's very much like that now and very successful and a, a beautiful child. My my son is... Sensing a butt, yeah. I, well, I, <laughs> and, I think. I try to use... And, 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 and. <laughs> and my son couldn't could read books, you know, was, was able to read way before my daughter was able to read, but couldn't read a room. Um, and was in <laughs> a lot of ways was like that, you know, um, not so much the kid staring off into space but the kid just like uh what run okay right oh i gotta run like within boundaries no 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 no. we don't do that and yeah. uh and 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 i know that there are a lot of other other parents out there whose kids you know go out on the stage and it it, it was more i experienced this more with my daughter who was out in you know ballet and, and excelling you know and meanwhile some of her dance mates on stage were like just kind of staring up at the lights and kind of, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and parents would come up to me and go, Oh, I really wish my daughter would be like that. And I, you know, I, you know, I, I didn't have the words at the time to just kind of say, Hey, you know, this is, they're five. And, you know, maybe my daughter will grow up to be a ballet professional ballerina, but probably not. Um, I just wanted to be happy, and right. that that's kind of what you should want for your kid, too. Abs- exactly, and it's it's so hard not to feel in the moment like everything is you 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 wonder what if, what have I done wrong? What's what's going on here? Is this a larger problem? Because so much of it is just is trial and error when they're when they're little. Um, obviously, with the firstborn, it's really trial and error because you're getting advice thrown at you from every possible angle. The the grandparents and the teachers and the uh, advice books and columns. And every kid is just so different. And every kid finds really weird ways <laughs> of being different. And so I, you know, I remember as a new parent, when, when my, my older son was a baby, um, especially, I was like, I always kind of shied away from like parent, parent, mommy, mommy and me meetups and stuff, just because I always kind of felt like somehow I'd be judged. That was, that was just me. Like, uh, that was a personal problem. Um, but I liked to kind of keep to my, in my own little, in our own little bubble. And then I found once they got into preschool, you, you see their behavior compared to other kids. Of course you worry because mm-hmm. <laughs> like the, there's the good stuff that you're really proud of them. They're, you're really proud that you see out of the drawings, your kid's drawing looks the most cohesive, like a thing. <laughs> and then, and then there's like the weird stuff where you see that they're, um, uh, like, you know, when you're watching through the window for story time and your kid's the only one that's wandering around, like making weird noises. And it's it's impossible to not compare. But I did find that as I started talking with other moms, uh, we would share the stories of the, 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 the chaos and the hilarity. Because when it's stuff that you just can't make up, when it's so out there... You know, you, there's like a, there's like a camaraderie. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, this is, this is where we're at today. Here's the bar. <laughs> it's pretty low. And, um, I mean, the, one of the other sources that I found too was just, um, I dedicated the, the book to three, uh, three specific preschool teachers that my sons had because all of their, we were, we were very fortunate. All of their preschool teachers were just absolutely phenomenal. They were, they were lovely. Um, individuals who helped them to grow, but there were 
three teachers that I felt like Matthew and Luke really shared the brunt of their yetis with. <laughs> and um, so it was like, it was Mrs. Kraft, Mrs. Tunney, and Mrs. Marino. I still call them by their, what I consider their teacher names. Mm -hmm. um, that won't ever stop. But um, they had this way of bringing, finding what was unique in each child and not just trying to work to bring out the best in them, but also to help me as a mom feel like everything was going to be okay. There was nothing wrong. There was nothing like, you know, if there's, if there's, if there's a problem, we'll help them. If there's something that needs to be corrected or addressed, we'll, we'll talk about it. But um, most of the time they're just like, yeah, this happened. It was, it was a, it was a, tan it was a meltdown. We'll start fresh tomorrow. You're mm -hmm. doing a great job. And there's nothing there's, that, that's so reassuring to hear that. And, um, you know, it just, it, it really, it, it takes, it takes a village yeah. to raise, to raise little yetis. It really does. Yeah. No, it does. And the other thing I, one of the things that I think that we forget as parents, and especially when we're, when we're comparing our kids to other kids in mm -hmm. these different situations, we forget the fact that the situations that our kids are expected to be in every day, that classroom where they're sitting down in a, at a desk and being, being good for eight hours, um, <laughs> ballet class, uh, soccer, you know, organized soccer, you know, that's not how kids have grown up in for most of mankind, you know, <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, school and, and all this kind of stuff is a fairly recent innovation for every kid. Uh, you know, we're talking a uh, couple hundred years. And so the fact that uh, our kids aren't naturally wanting to sit at a desk for eight hours a day um, shouldn't come as a surprise to us. I think we should be more surprised when we see the kids going, oh, wow, look at that kid. What's wrong with that kid? He wants to sit all day long. <laughs> I mean, you know, each kid, each kid just uh, finds their own, their own niche. I agree. You know, it's, it's funny cause I'm thinking back to the preschool and, um, yeah, both of them, it was so play-based. It was, it was definitely a challenge during the lockdown specifically. Um, that was hard. I remember my, my poor son, Luke, who was only three at the time, we'd drive past a playground and you'd see the yellow caution tape. He'd be like, Oh, it's a playground. Can we go? And be like, sorry, buddy. No, we can't. It's closed today. And he's just like, did you see this poor three-year-old with the weight of the world on his shoulders? Um, you're 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 right. They 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 like to to play and to run and to jump and to stretch and to to be to to just be big and loud. And it I had this like you know I had this just vision like you know I uh, picture in my mind that this big and powerful yeti in the story is how the kid feel it's like you know it's his way of showing how big and powerful he pictures himself as and so it's 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 hard to contain that in a classroom setting there's you start you know they start they start learning the rules and learning the expectations but yeah like in the book he's he's the Matthew at one point is required to like you know he's sitting for story time he's supposed to be quiet and he feels the Yeti kind of starting to get fidgety. And then all of a sudden he has this massive sneeze and the kids all like jump to their toes. And he's like, it's okay. There's just a Yeti in my nose. Like, <laughs> So it's his way of envisioning it and picturing it in himself. And sometimes it helps him. And sometimes, sometimes it gets in the way, but that's, that's what growing up is all about. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love that too. This idea that there's a Yeti in my nose and my belly or my hair. It, I think because, you know, we, we talk about how we feel as parents when we see our kids, you know, not fitting in or not doing what everybody else is doing. Um, kids see that too. The kids know mm -hmm. when they're not it able to, you know, kind of get with the program and, um, uh, you know, and, and I don't think um, oftentimes they, they, they don't feel great about it. And I think that this is just helping them understand that, hey, there's, it ain't me, there's, there's a Yeti that's causing me to do this. Or just that, that it's, that it's okay. Mm -hmm. Like that it's okay to feel different. It's okay to have your own wants and your own desires. There is, there's a time and a place 
to be big and silly. And um, one of the one of the takeaway messages in the book is that the mom you find out the mom at the end has a yeti herself because like her yet her yeti is her big love for 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 her son, and she's telling Matthew she's like um, our yetis are just fine as long as they show love. Mm -hmm. And so it's the idea that it's okay to, so it's, so it's okay to want to play something different. Kids are very, like, um, when I say egotistical, it's not meant as a negative. Like that's, I remember them saying like, you know, kids that little three, four or five years old, they're all about themselves because that's how they're, that's how they're wired. That's how they're supposed to like, you know, be wired to grow. And, um, you know, part of like, you know, the idea that it's okay to feel big. It's okay to have strong feelings. You're going to have these strong feelings as long as they show love and kindness and caring toward other people to try, to try and navigate it in a constructive way rather than what can easily and oftentimes does become a destructive one. Right. right. I, I can't tell you how many, how many, Block towers were knocked down. Now it's now they're older. So now it's a now it's Minecraft. I could share a really funny story. Um, very very quickly, my boys were playing Minecraft, uh-huh. and I didn't realize. So my older son Matthew had knocked down this little shack that Luke had built. They were playing dual mode, and so Luke just went nuclear and he poured lava on this castle that Matthew had been building for like a week. And you can't I don't know if anyone knows this, but you can't stop lava in Minecraft. It just keeps going. There's no way to stop it. And we're watching it slowly melt down and you see that Matthew's just like ready to lose it. <laughs> so Luke expressed some big feelings in a very uh in a, a very it's safe way. way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Digitally aggressive. <laughs> Needed to show some some love and compassion. Maybe not the uh, the the lava the mm-hmm. lava meltdown. <laughs> well, I think that's important for us to remind our kids to always act with love and compassion, and remind ourselves to do that when we're acting with our kids. Yes. <laughs> and one of the things I noticed when I was um, checking out your website, you've been involved in adapting lots and lots of books. You also were um, involved in, in helping to bring to life one of the books that we've celebrated here on the podcast, Sea Train. Really? Which... Oh, that's wonderful. Yes. yes. I worked with Bridget on a Sea Train um, earlier earlier this year. Yep. I Bridget is the uh, the creator, and um, she had the this wonderful concept for for the story, and um, uh, we happened to uh, uh, through our agents collaborate, and so I uh, wrote the wrote the manuscript for it, and Bridget um, edited it, and then now Sea Train's out in the world. Yeah, yeah. oh, yeah. that's great. Yes, yes, and so th- you have a huge library of books that you've helped create. Uh- some that people might be surprised about. You've been uh, involved in um, adapting um, stories of th- that my son loved, uh, Captain Underpants, yep. and uh, <laughs> and lots of Disney folks uh, material. What is it? What 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 do you prefer more? Adapting, a, you know, a, a set of characters or stories that that exist that somebody else has created, or coming up and, and, and starting from scratch with a, a story like there's a Yeti in my tummy. Um, I mean, it's a lot, it's a, it's a more nuanced answer than just uh, one or the other. So uh-huh. I, I originally wanted, I just, I decided like as a kid that I wanted to write, but as a kid, I wanted to write for children's television because I used to watch so many cartoons as a kid. I, I probably says something about like, I wasn't the one running around outside. I was, I was, <laughs> I was watching a lot of shows, but I remember as a kid, I liked to see the stories and think about how I would have done them different or what I liked about it or what I wanted to change, what I didn't like. And I didn't think worked character wise and with, with like GI Joe and um, uh, what was the one uh, Dungeons and Dragons. It was like this little cartoon I used to watch, but in any event, um, I so I worked as an editor in children's licensed publishing for many years, and then I went into freelance writing for children's licensed publishing when Matthew was born, and so I've done almost two hundred licensed titles. Um, I I love 
working on the license stuff. I love being able to create additional content against properties that I think are so phenomenal and exciting and that the kids are excited about. But it was, it really was always my, my, my hope and my dream to have my own book out there, mm -hmm. my own, like, cause you know, I'm taking, I feel ownership over the license titles, but they're not full. They're not a hundred percent mine mm -hmm. because they're licensed. That's right. the, the definition. And this is like, you know, this was the first, the first time that I'd come up with a manuscript where I was like, I think this is really good. I, I think this could work. I think this will, this, this could be something. And so I'm, yeah, I'm immensely, I'm immensely proud of, of the book. I'm, I'm really excited about the series and I'm just overwhelmed with how much support from friends and family and like the, 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 the whole literary community, the library is like, everyone has really come out to support it. And I I'm very, I'm very humbled by that. I wasn't, I wasn't always, I've been in licensed publishing for so long. I wasn't expecting that. And it's really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, we should tell everybody where they can go to see all the amazing stories that you brought to life. Absolutely. So my website is meredithrusu.com. So it's just my first and last name.com. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Meredith Rusu writes and, um, uh, obviously, the books are for sale on Amazon and Barnes and Noble, and on my website, there's a whole list of of everything I've written with links. So, if anyone is interested in seeing some Captain Underpants adaptations, or I've got I've got a, a Bluey book coming out in four days, I think, which I'm very excited. I happen to be a big fan of Bluey, um, so uh, that's where I can be found. Um, and also on my Instagram. We're going to be revealing the neck, the character for the next book in the Mighty Mood series very soon. Awesome. It's a well, secret right now, but it's coming. It's so close. I'm excited. <laughs> well, we're excited too. And uh, we want to encourage everybody to check out There's a Yeti in My Tummy. It is book one in the Big Feeling series from our guest, Meredith Rousseau. Hey, Meredith, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me on. This was wonderful. I appreciate it. <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast and will join us for the next exciting episode of the show. We are so grateful that you're part of our beautiful Reading With Your Kids family. We'd love for you to connect with us on social media, facebook.com slash readingwithyourkids, at readingwithyourkids on Instagram, at Jedly Magic on Twitter. If you are on LinkedIn, please connect with Jed Doherty. We also have a Reading With Your Kids page on LinkedIn. We would love for you to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Authors, click on the Authors Click Hit button to find out how you can be a guest here in the show and find out how we can help you celebrate your book with the world. And also, parents, please be sure to visit readingwithyourkids.com to download our free online magazine. Hey, we want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our amazing guest. I also want to thank my team, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Chris Starty, Anna O'Leary, Soji Franklin. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And thank you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading With Your Kids Podcast.